Okay, uh, thanks. T uh, today we're going to talk with Chong Kim, who is uh, uh, Director of, of, of Network Architecture at, at Barefoot Networks and has uh, also uh, previously worked on the Azure platform at, at Microsoft. Today um, we're going to talk to Chong about uh, P4 um, and, and various uh, things going on with P4, uh, which um, we're also going to learn about a bit in the course. Uh, so th um, Chong's been uh, in on P4 almost since the, the very beginning. So we'll, we'll get a chance to learn a lot about P4 today. Great. So, thanks a lot for your invitation, Nick. Yeah, thanks for spending the time. Um, I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about you know, wh what P4 is, because um, you know, I could describe it in my own words, but I think it'd be nice to hear it from you. And then sort of how did it come about? Where did the idea come from? And what problem is it trying to solve? And, and, yeah, wh where, just where did it come from? Sure. So P4 is a language. It's a domain-specific language, which networking users can use to describe the behavior of network forwarding plane, also known as data plane. So the, the, the main original paper was published about a year and a half ago at ACM CCR. And I was not one of the main authors, but I started working with the authors earlier on. Uh, so that's why I um, and and I fell in love with this language and the, uh, the 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 vision that this language tries to achieve, and I felt that it was very plausible and then very impactful. That's why I joined this uh, bandwagon. So P four is um, um, the main motivation behind P four is that today, if you look at um, all the networking solutions, the um, there is varying degree of programmability, but all this programmability at, ends at the, um, at the interface between control plane and data plane. Up to the control plane, you have some visibility and some programmability, but once you go into the, you know, the real data plane where you know, individual packets are handled, it be, just becomes a black box, and you, you just have no idea what's going on and how to manipulate that and how you can collect a lot of critical information for you. So, and, and the, the, um, of course, you could try to use CPU or FPGA, which has been, you know, programmable since the inception, but you cannot get the right, you know, performance target, because right? switches have to meet some, you know, multi uh, terabps speeds, uh, or, you know, some um, you know, giga PPS of rate as well. So, um, and, and the industry has been sort of also changing and then trying to sort of achieve this kind of programmable um, packet forwarding paradigm in terms of networking chip architecture. So these two, basically, the desire from the networking users for programmability and the also networking chip industry's recognition that, hey, we may actually be able to come up with programmable solution without or almost minimal performance and size penalty. So this two things meet together at this point. And um, to marry these two trends, you need a domain-specific high-level language that users can use to program these new types of devices. That's where P4 came about. I see. So yeah, in the original, in the original paper, you talk about uh, P4 being able to kind of program a, a, a wide variety of these general purpose uh, programmable hardware, um, uh, it, it thinks for programmable networking hardware. And, um, um, it, it seems like um, you know there's a wide range of, of possible um, you know hardware targets, shall we say, including things like FPGAs, which may not really fit into the sort of high performance multi-chip architecture. Um, so, um, what do you see sort of as the as the um, the main um, the main place where P4 um, can ultimately be used? I mean, do you view it sort of as a something that should be used for, for more general purpose targets? Or do you think that it's really going to end up being focused on uh, high performance uh, multi-chip architectures? Well, the language itself is actually designed intentionally to be neutral, to be able to cover a variety of targets. And, um, but what that means is that you probably have to choose a common denominator approach. Right? Because if you think about CPU and FPGA or NPU, for example, they're very flexible, especially CPU. You can do almost anything, and then networking is just one of the numerous applications. 
So you might just ask, hey, I can program my new software switch using C and C++, of course, but that doesn't give the right abstraction for the network engineers, right? Maybe that's a good enough abstraction for developers or core developers, but network engineers who have domain-specific knowledges about networking protocols and operations cannot speak that language very easily and then deliver the new networking data plane in a timely fashion. And that's why if you want to come up with domain-specific networking language targeting a lot of tar you know, a variety of targets, you have to choose the, a common denominator approach, and then P4 has chosen that approach. Um, and, and to be a little more specific, that's why in P4 language, you don't see something like pointers. Because pointer operation, if you think about it, is very expensive because you, you have to access the memory multiple times. And then you only have a few you know, hardware clock cycles to handle these packets at multi bps pipeline. Right. P4 also doesn't have abstraction or language constructs for, say, recursion or floating point or loops. It does allow cycles when you define a parse graph, but it doesn't allow looping, when, especially when you define the match action pipeline, because you can't hold these packets and then revisit these packets multiple times. Right? So, so those things are deliberately not included in the language spec. But again, FPGAs and NPUs and CPUs and even GPUs are flexible enough. So they, they in terms of hardware feature, they they, they are they are offering a superset anyway, so they can support P4 very easily. I see. So if you wanted to compile a P4 program to, to an FPGA, there, there's kind of no problem, right? Because the, the the facilities of an FPGA sort of offer a superset of, of functions compared to what you can express. Right. For, so right. Exactly. Um, I see. Um, cool. So. Um, I, I've also noticed a lot of progress in, in the P4 sort of language and consortium over, over the past year, particularly even the past few months. I think the students in the course have noticed that, uh, you know, things are happening. Um, and it seems like a lot of companies are interested, in, including Cisco, which I think is, is quite remarkable. Um, and and what, do you, what do you think are the, are the company's main interests in P4? Like, do you think that they're uh, developing their own compilers for, for, their, for their own specialized hardware? or um, you know, um, right? Are they developing their own targets to compile P4 to? Or, and why, why do you think they're interested in, in P4? I, I think they're very much interested in this work. And in fact, um, there was uh, quite a few representatives uh, at the uh, P4 meetings recently. And um, um, one of the executives from Cisco actually um, joined the panel and then shared his opinion about P4. And literally what he says is that his P4 is really big deal. It means a lot of opportunities opening up for Cisco, not just for Cisco, but for almost the entire industry. And then he actually gave a few reasons. So that, that might actually, if I may rephrase those you know, summaries, or his points, it might be actually helpful for this interview. Absolutely. So, yeah. So obviously, there are a few low-hanging fruits. For example, individual uh, system vendors can differentiate themselves at the forwarding plane behavior level rather than just control plane software. And so uh, right now, if you're actually familiar with what is happening in the, um, especially data, cent data center style or enterprise style um, market, the, the chip is um, chip that is predominantly used is just a very, I mean, there is only one or two chips that are used very widely. And therefore, although you have a large number of systems delivered to the end customers, the actual data plane behavior is almost identical. Mm -hmm. And has nobody is actually able to distinguish themselves from others easily. And also, P4 or software-based data plane description means that the, the system vendors can move very fast at the software speed rather than hardware speed. And if you're familiar with hardware development life cycles, it's at least three years. Mm -hmm. right? So whereas in software, you know, things can move a lot more faster, at least an order of magnitude faster. Mm -hmm. And, um, they can, the, the, the vendors can also come up with different uh, devices, more customized toward target, you know, um, 
consumers or maybe some sub industries for example a device for financial industry device for medical industry device for uh, large enterprises or data centers right now they're all using the same chip almost the same chip and uh, but if you look at their um, you know requirements data plane requirements they're actually very different for example large data centers they don't use multicast instead they want a lot of routing tables and they want a lot of echoes and so on whereas financial industries actually unicast is almost a marginal application for them they want multicast a lot of uh, uh, replication but done extremely fast and they want a lot of visibility in the data plane and so on so how would you meet these kind of different requirements uh, fast enough right so that's that's software's benefit and finally another another thing that came up at the latest meeting is that um, uh, the actually um, a few large companies had um, or they tried to develop um, programmable networking chips by themselves they might actually be working on it right now their chips and their compilers and uh, optimization tools and so on but based on some earlier experiences what they say is that the moment you have programmable solutions hardware bugs simply go away mm -hmm. Reason being that the programmable chips, programmable data plane components means that individual forwarding elements like match action, abstraction units, or these kind of things, they're they're the same. They're fungible resources. You and you just have a large number of those fungible resources in in hardware. And so, if even if one of them or some of them has some bugs or hardware bugs, you can very easily mask them at the software level, because it's not that you have only one module doing one this particular function. You can realize this function, say, IPv4 forwarding on different parts of the hardware anyway, because hardware is the same. Right? So this allows software to cope with uh, you know, a lot of problems very easily. And, 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 and even financially, this means a lot of big benefits to the system's vendors. Because right now, when they deliver you know, solutions that happen to have some defects at the hardware level, they have to replace those devices in the field, and then it means a lot of money, really. Mm -hmm. right? They have to compensate for the disruption and those kind of things as well. Whereas if you can patch those kind of problems rather easily by software release, it's, it's just so easy and cheaper for them. That's interesting, yeah. So rather than basically having to recall a bunch of faulty hardware or go through a whole hardware development cycle, you could you could mask some of these faults. Exactly. Uh, very interesting. Yep. And then I guess the other thing that you mentioned was basically the opportunity to take like a fixed resource and, and do specialization like for a particular use case, like in a data center and a financial uh, network. The same set of resources might be repurposed for one thing or another, depending on whether you need lots and lots of tables or whether or not you need multicast. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 interesting. Uh, it's, you've listed like a couple um, kind of, um, uh, I guess, use cases. Yeah. Uh, I guess you might say, um, you know, specific uh, needs in data centers and, and in financial networks and mm -hmm. like that. Um, um, and uh, I guess, I guess, from what you're saying, the way I could interpret that is a network operator and someone who's basically either designing a data center or designing a financial network might basically have some flexibility in terms of how they design that in terms of everything down to packet formats and uh, mm -hmm. um, using p4 do you who do you think the kind of main users will be of p4 do you do you expect it would be for example a network operator an architect in a in a financial institution who basically you know designs the network now with this new uh, you know relaxed constraint that they can have custom data formats and packet processing pipelines? Or do you think it's going to be a switch vendor that basically does this and packages it up and sells it to the, to the institution? I mean, where, where do you think that, that line will be? That's a great question. So configuring or describing data plane um, can actually mean uh, various things. It's almost a spectrum and wide spectrum, right? On one extreme end, there are these Sort of super user of super users like data center network teams who actually you know can introduce a completely new protocol with completely different types of pipeline working in a totally different fashion for example i'm gonna do source routing everywhere 
in my data center. I don't even want to use IPv4 format because it's, it's my playground. I can do whatever I want. On the other extreme end, there are you know, typical networking operators in sort of small uh, enterprises or campus networks. They, they don't really need to you know, use drastically different networking protocols or data plane. They just want some flexibility in the data plane. For example, just adjusting table sizes. Right? When you started building your network, you expected to have this many subnets but it's growing, so you, you're just wondering whether I could have a little bigger routing table because I'm not using you know, a large Mac forwarding table, for example. Right. So those. So so, and then of course, in between these two extremes, there's you know various points. Um, so this. So but now let's start with this extreme end, right? Where you actually want to do a lot of new things. I, I do agree with you that the, the um, systems vendors or network device developers, they will be definitely consuming P4 first time because they have to deliver new switch or new, new, uh, new devices with new features very soon. And also the network architects in very large uh, companies like you know, this uh, online web scale uh, service providers such as Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, they will definitely start using P4 because they have, you know, they, they basically want to build a, a, a very well optimized network, especially data center network and inter data center backbone, meeting their particular customers or application needs very well. And, um, and, 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 and then gradually more and more people, uh, especially when they feel that, yeah, data playing programming especially or maybe even field reprogramming is doable and I have done that and I feel comfortable about that now then they may try to do uh, you know this kind of programming more often right? and also who knows you know there could be some third-party concerting services which are doing this kind of data plane optimizations for small to mid enterprises right where, where they have network operators but they don't really you know, know the, the, the full details needed to uh, design new data plan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you, I mean, what do you think are, um, are some, um, some examples where you might want to do this kind of in the field uh, switch reconfiguration? You mentioned one which I hadn't thought of, which I thought was pretty interesting, where you said, oh, someone's running out of, say, uh, FIB uh, memory for the, for the IP yeah. or FIB, and they want to steal some memory away from the from the Mac table or something like that. That seems really, really interesting, actually. Um, I imagine that comes up quite a bit. And that seems to me like sort of an emergency use case. Um, do you think that there are others? I mean, do you think there are going to be a lot of instances where there's going to be field reprogrammability or reconfiguration um, on the fly? Um, even to the extent, I mean, now you sort of look at, if you look at the control plane, you kind of think of that as sort of happening you know, uh, for lack of a better word, kind of in real time. I mean, do, do, you, do you imagine any kinds of in-the-field reprogrammability that's either frequent or something that would happen on a, on a, a um, high frequency? Well, um, probably not that frequently, especially mm -hmm. in the beginning. Um, it's, it's not like reconfiguring your device with new echoes or new routing protocols or new BGP neighbors like it. It, it won't be that level. But that said, um, especially based on my experiences at, say, Microsoft, when you build a large data center network, your expected um, you know, depreciation cycle of a network is typically three years. And, and within that three years, Things do change significantly. Mm -hmm. For example, your your policies can change. Your address assignment policies, your routing policies, your access control policies, your QoS policies do change. And um, and when they change, sometimes you you find out that oh, I cannot meet these new new policies easily with this fixed set of functionality or this fixed data plane architecture. So you really want to revisit that once in a while, whenever, you, especially when you have new, new set of policies and new network architecture. And three years actually is very long if you think about the way 
these web scale providers work. They typically plan only for about six months. And then beyond that, they don't really know. It's not that they're uh, you know, incapable of doing that. It's just the nature of the word. Things change too fast. Things grow too fast. And the, 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 the types of application that become very popular change very quickly. So you, you have to be very agile. And, and, um, and we were actually hit by this kind of significant routing and address assignment policy changes several times over three years. And, and right now, if you don't have any data plugin programmability, the only way handling this is just going to your vendor and, hey, I, I have this urgent needs. Can you just feed this into your next, next generation chip architecture and then negotiate with them? And, and it's a it cost you a lot of money too. process. Yes, exactly. Yep. Because you have your back up against the wall and you need this feature. Yes. And you need it now. Uh, and you're dependent on the vendor's release cycle, I guess. Exactly. And, yeah. and that's, that's why, um, if you think about it, that's why data, large data centers try to use more and more um, uh, VM switch, software switch capability to, to cushion this kind of uh, mismatch between policies and the capability to realize those policies. Because VM switches are malleable for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? But there are only so much you can do using only, only these both ends. Right? Individual hubs are still fixed, and you sometimes you really need big changes in the individual hubs. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the architectures have kind of adapted to this to this sort of uh, uh, relatively slow moving changes in, in switch capabilities by kind of putting all the f all the flexibility and function at the at the hosts and at the edges, and then mm -hmm. basically tunneling over the over the switches. Yeah, um, but 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 maybe you see that changing. Uh, you know, if the switches become a bit more agile, um, it, it, I mean maybe. Maybe the pendulum will swing back. Well, it probably won't swing back entirely back to the original position yeah. because the, there, there is something that these end host virtual machine switches can do very well. For example, maintaining a large amount of connection state because it's software, it's RAM, you can introduce almost millions or tens of million connection state very easily. And then the integration between the software switch and the, the Sort of logically centralized control plane is much easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are certainly benefits to that approach, but what I would imagine is that currently they they want they, they just view network as a black box. But if you can collect a lot of information, of, you know, from the individual hubs, like for example, link utilization, queuing latency, then you can actually introduce intelligence on both sides, and then um, you know basically choose the best approach for each you know need. Right? Mm -hmm. So you could have hybrid approach or more network-centric approaches for some types of applications. Yeah, in terms of use cases, I mean, you mentioned this sort of uh, reprogrammability and, and things like that to sort of make good use of resources, and um, that seems really compelling. Um, but also, those are sort of uh, existing kinds of use cases. And I'm wondering, like, do you see, for example, with P4, that the, the new kinds of use cases may be possible? Um, for example, you know, I've got a switch, but suddenly I need this, you know, very specialized access control or firewalling capability, and I don't want to buy a whole new firewall to do that, so let me just put a little thing in my, in my pipeline. Do you, do you see those kinds of uh, use cases as, as possible as well? Yeah, definitely. So the, um, especially uh, one of the things that, one of the particular uh, network management activities that can benefit immediately and immensely by these programmable devices is network monitoring and analysis or, or diagnostics. Mm -hmm. Because uh, right now, um, there are only a few tools that you can use, some counters and maybe some sampling-based S-flow. And uh, as you might know, NetFlow is there, but it's very expensive to build in, in merchant silicon. So no merchant silicon supports NetFlow right now. But, um, but with this you know, basic sampling, basic mirroring, and some counters, um, debugging networking problem is a really painful process. Whereas imagine that you can define your own counters, uh, your own custom mirroring mechanism, or custom instrumentation mechanism to, to collect these uh, per packet 
information from the individual hubs, then you can think of doing a lot of exciting stuff. So you could gather, I mean, more stuff than just uh, you know NetFlow style statistics. You might do, you know, uh, specialized kind of counters for specific parts yeah. of the space, or 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 you know, full PCAPs, or or what kinds of things might 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 be possible. For, in for example, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this paper called uh, Millions of Minions. It's also it also goes by Tiny Packet Program, published it last year's SIGCOM. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so I worked with um, Bimal and Mohammed on this uh, project. So uh, basically, the idea is uh, let's let's make each individual packet collect some useful information uh, about that particular packet while being forwarded from every individual hub. For example, can I collect the switch IDs? Can I collect the input port ID, output port ID, so that I can actually enable layer one physical trace route? for every single packet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why is this useful? It, it may sound very primitive and simple enough, but the value of this, especially in the context of large data center network where this pseudo-random spreading is used everywhere, right? Yeah. You have some particular problem to one particular connection or packet. How do you pinpoint that this packet got lost exactly there, or this packet exercised this particular physical path and hence this problem? How do you correlate these two? Right, without that kind of fine-grained, um, you know, monitoring capability. Yeah, no, that's incredibly useful. I mean, yeah, I've, I've you know, uh, lots of stuff out there that sort of try to do layer two topology discovery and, and other things in enterprises as well, and it's uh, it's all kind of imperfect at best, or sort of involves dumping bridge tables all the time and and lots of uh, lots of things like that. So I could see I could see some pretty interesting. Uh, use cases there in, in enterprise networks as well as the data center. Yeah, yep. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, so so we're talking a little bit about like measurements and counters and, and and things like that, and that's obviously just one type of state. I mean, what do you think about uh, the idea of putting state into packet processing pipelines in general, and what kind of support does P4 have for that? I mean, other use cases might be things like stateful firewalls or. Uh, you know, QoS related kinds of applications like token bucket shapers. All these things require yeah. some amount of state in the pipeline somewhere. Does, does, do you see P4 or, or you know uh, the, the hardware on, onto which it would compile as, as being able to support those kinds of things? That's a great question. So P4 right now has a few language constructs that can be used to model this stateful object. So it has counters. Counters are basically very primitive stateful memory, right? You you add some value, you read some value, add by one or by number of bytes of that packet, uh, and then save it back. And then when you when you receive a packet going to that particular memory location next time, you build on the value that happens to be sitting there. So and enhance it's stateful, right? Counters, meters, as you said, are the examples of uh, stateful operations, and then. Uh, P4 uh, defines them as embedded or uh, built-in language constructs or uh, pipeline objects. In addition to that, uh, P4 also understands the need for sort of generic stateful memory. Instead of doing just counting or mirroring, you might want to do your own elaborate operations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so we model uh, that notion uh, using uh, something called register in the P4 spec the latest P4 spec. So it is there, but that said, it's a, it's an evolving, especially an evolving area in, in, the, in the current P4 language spec, because um, if you go through that you know, line of reasoning, you can quickly discover that stateful memory is a really rich set of functionality, because uh, the, the very basic notion is very simple. Read, it's read, modify, update. Read some value from a location, modify it, and then save it back. Right? That's RMA, read, modify, update. But when you do modify, what kind of operations are you going to allow? Right? Are you going to allow almost an, uh, sort of unbounded you know, expressions, arithmetic expressions? Uh, also, when you do modify, are you going to allow just modify, or are you going to allow test and modify, for example? test whether this value is larger than or equal to something, and then modify. Mm -hmm. So the 
depending upon what kind of semantics you allow, it can actually do a lot of interesting things. And um, we don't know how to model this in a really nice fashion and also in a, in a sort of target uh, oblivious fashion uh, and also um, useful for uh, a lot of different targets as well. So that's, that's a, um, a particular area where we need contributions. I see. So basically, the, the lowest common denominator of stuff that you were mentioning towards the beginning, like trying to find, yep. you're trying to support stateful operations for a, for a variety of, of yep. hardware, you need to basically build abstractions on whatever that lowest yep. common denominator really yep. is. Yep. And another, another important thing about stateful thing is that um, if you think about it, basically almost all the buffer management algorithms, like scheduling and... Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, especially scheduling is uh, stateful operations. Mm -hmm. which, which queue are you going to serve next time? It's not just a stateless function. It's based on the history of your serving of other, all the other queues, right? And hence, it's stateful. And uh, we don't know how to model this nicely. And in fact, we probably don't have an entirely programmable scheduler yet. In, in the hardware as well. So that's why P4 currently does not cover this um, uh, queuing mechanism as a programmable target yet. It, P4 covers programmable parser and programmable match action units, programmable deparser, but the shared buffer, the, the, the logical description of the behavior of buffering and scheduling, that's not covered by the P4 spec yet. But we would love to go there at some point in the future. And you think the, the 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 main sort of hurdle for that now is trying to figure out what the what the what the model should be? Is, is... Yeah, that's one hurdle, absolutely. And the other hurdle is that we 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 actually don't have very good programmable hardware that can support such such abstraction as well. So we need we need support from both sides. I see, I see. Um... I mean, and also when I say we, it doesn't mean just barefoot. The industry doesn't know how to come up with this programmable Offer and scheduler yet. I see. I see. At multi tera BPS, it's it's really demanding work. Right? It seems like if if that could be solved, that there's just a tremendous opportunity for it, right? I mean, I mean, you spoke earlier of financial networks and and um, others. I, mean, I could imagine having really strict QoS requirements and and yep. with uh, really strong constraints on needing super low latency for specific flows. Yeah. Yep. yep. Interesting. So that's that seems really important. I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, just the sort of um, mechanics of, of P four as well, and, and in terms of compilation and 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 what pro and what problems you see there. I mean, um, I know that that uh, the ONF has had this uh, protocol independent uh, forwarding working group, and there's some other sort of efforts looking at um, independent rep uh, sorry inter intermediate representations and. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little confused myself, just like as to how to think about P4 versus intermediate representations. Like, is, do you think it's correct to think of P4 more as like a high-level language that people would specify these pipelines in, or is it more of like an intermediate representation? You know, something that a compiler might actually use to optimize the layout for a particular piece of hardware, or is it, or is it somewhere in between these things? Or what's the right way to think about where P4 sits there and how it might? Interact like is it an IR or does it does it interface to IRs and what's the big picture? I see. Um, I think the people in the P4 language consortium or P4 community usually tend to think that P4 as a just high level language that a user can directly use to describe their own data plane behavior, and um, and I also understand that why why IR intermediate representation can also be useful for some optimization or cross-target optimization purposes. The, the reason why the P4 language consortium focuses on the language first is just it's a purely program, you know, pragmatic, prag, pragmatic purposes, meaning that um, at the end of the day, users want to program this, and then they, they need a language to program this. They cannot program the device using IR. They need a language first. Yep. And then once you have a language, especially it's very important to have a um, common industry-wide language. Otherwise, nobody will start moving, right? 
hard to move at all. If you have a, a totally fragmented word, which language should I learn? I mean, this industry is just starting, and then if you have to, if you're saying that, hey, there is this language, this language, and different targets may have different languages, it, it doesn't help anybody. The, the, the industry might not move at all. So that's why we believe that the common industry-wide language is very important, and then solving that problem is probably the first step. And then once we have that, and then we, of course, we will have multiple targets, then the, the importance of IR, especially as a vehicle to enable cross-target you know, target optimization and cross-target portability, may come next, right, within a couple years or three years from now. That makes sense. I guess it's it's sort of like doesn't make sense to necessarily have a, like propose an IR before you have agreement on what the high level language might be yep. first, right? Exactly. So once you have that, the IR may be useful for cross target optimization. Yeah, exactly. But you see those optimiz. It sounds like you see those optimizations as probably happening in an IR rather than a compiler manipulating before itself to to do, sort of do those optimizations. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Cool. What do you think about, um, I mean, you mentioned earlier, I thought it was really interesting and something I hadn't thought about, you know, this idea that, like, you might you may have buggy hardware that ships to the field and, you know, without the programmability, you're, you're kind of in, in trouble. <laughs> um, but, uh, of course, like, a P4 specification could be buggy too, right? Uh, um, yes. now the, the big advantage there is if you've got a buggy specification, you can of course, you know, redo it and 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 sort of recompile and push it. And you don't have to wait on the develop the hardware development cycle, but you can still have bugs, right? So how, what's the what's the sort of um, uh, I guess what's the sort of big story there? But what's also the current picture in terms of you know what kind of tools exist for verification and debugging, what things don't exist but would, would be nice to have, I guess. So um, I, I think we need an equivalent to almost everything that we have on the CPU side programming world. Like, what's the equivalent of GDB? What's an equivalent? Yeah, like, what's, is there a GDB before? Yeah. Exactly. What's, uh, how can I take, uh, what's an equivalent of core dump? How can I analyze that? Um, What's an equivalent to profiler? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, what's an equivalent to static and dynamic verification tools and so on? So I think it's a really rich area. And um, the, a, few, a few of us who are working on these programmable targets as well as compilers are trying to come up with some of this. But it's, yeah, we're just all starting right now. So it's a, I, I would just say that this is a huge, um, uh, and reach research and engineering area where everybody can, you know, actually find a very interesting problem and then contribute. Mm -hmm. in, in, um, in your experience programming P4 so far, and I mean, in, in, in terms of debugging and verification, like, do you see common bugs show up already? I mean, sort of what's the equivalent of, like, dereferencing a null pointer or something like that in, in P4? Well, fortunately, we don't have those nasty problems because we don't have pointers. Yeah, you know, you have no memory, you said, so you can avoid those, but, like, uh, are there other are there other sort of analogous uh, kind of bugs? Um, I think semantic bugs are probably hard to debug, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the problems in your P4 code itself, right? it's, it's protocol specific. For example, you use, in, in, in one part of your P4 program, you assume that this particular bit will indicate this meaning, but in some other part of your people program, you you were you looking at some other fields, some other bits. I see. So you parse something out of the packet, assuming that basically this is a source IP address or a VLAN tag or a something, and then later in the pipeline you do some operation like a write or a yep. decrement or something, and, and you're just doing it to the completely wrong part of the the, the bits. Yep. Yes. Makes exactly. that makes sense. Interesting. Um, yeah. And also the one of the learnings that we've gotten while using P4 programs and then trying to come up with new applications using P4 programs, uh, we realized that um, the exception handling part is weak, especially in P4 spec, as well as the some of the targets. Um, so uh, for example, when you receive an unparsable packet, how do you handle that? Um, 
when the packets are actually going through this pipeline, uh, one of the fields has a totally unexpected value. And uh, how do you handle that? Right? So those boundary and exceptional case handling, that's, that's usually a little bit uh, you know, tricky. And then that's exactly where you know, debugger and profiler-like uh, tools are very helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in, in Barefoot, we have our own set of solutions, at least um, not, it's not complete, it's, it's, but we have some debugging mechanism, we have um, some stepping into mechanisms. But again, as I said, uh, some of these are uh, very target specific because depending on which hardware you're working on, the, the hardware may actually have this support or not. So, um, so it's a it's it's a it's an interesting and, and big problem, I would say, in general. Yeah, interesting. So um, I guess um, that that opens up kind of a whole line of, of possible research, like you said, and, and sort of yeah. verification yeah. and debugging. Yeah. I, like, I like the way you put it. Every every problem that basically uh, we've thought about in software debugging now now suddenly you can sort of ask the analogous question. But let me let me share one thing though. So. I, I don't want to scare off the potential P4 programmers because here is, the, here is one lesson that I got. Um, to come up with a almost data center style switch or a, a, a feature set equivalent to the uh, other fixed function chips feature set, we had to write a, P4, a reference P4 program, and then the size of that P4 program is just only about four to 5,000 lines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not like you're debugging you know, multi-million line C code developed by you know, um, an army of developers. Right? So if you have networking, yeah, network domain specific um, backgrounds, debugging this is not a sort of a, you know, a Herculean task, I would say. Mm -hmm. An interesting and exciting task, is especially if you have the right set of tools. What do you think are some other, uh, I mean, just final question, I mean, what do you think are some other kind of unanswered questions that, that P4 introduces? I mean, we talked, you know, we've been talking a lot about sort of, uh, you know, compilation and optimization and debugging, verification. At the beginning, you talked about kind of new use cases. Yep. Um, I guess, like, what, it, what for someone who kind of wants to think about uh, research in P4, what, yeah. oh, you mentioned measurement and, and monitoring as well, which I thought was a cool one. Um, so um, anything else that you want to say in terms of, uh, you know, things that are good places to get started and, and sort of think about, uh, you know, where the big, the big victories might be? Yeah. Um, so one of the, one of the topics uh, that come up often, especially these days in the language community, is this thing called uh, language architecture separation. So the original P4 language assumed that um, the language is going to be used for switch style devices, but you don't necessarily need to use P4 only to build switch. You can use P4 to do any packet processing or come up with any packet processing devices like NICs, network interface cards, or uh, some appliances, middle boxes, yeah, boxes yeah. yeah, right. So, um, and those devices or you know targets typically have different architecture than switches. Mm -hmm. So, and but the current P4 spec sort of combined these two very tightly, and hence um, it doesn't allow architectural uh, expansion without introducing new language keywords, new language constructs. Mm -hmm. right? So. It, it's usually very bad if, if your language keeps changing, especially for the compiler and debugger and those people. So to keep the language core static and fixed and small enough and yet allow expansion of the scope, I think it may be very useful to decouple language and architecture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's a sort of very big problem and, and uh, interesting problem on its own. So contributions, uh, on that side will be very helpful, and it can also have immediate impact to the people consortium. Um, register modeling is again a, an important topic, I think. The stateful memory modeling. Measuring state, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
buffer again it's, it's it's there are two big problems underlying there how how can you design a programmable hardware for that as well as how would you model it um, the yeah monitoring debugging diagnostics use cases those are i think again very useful uh, or a huge topic on its own on the compiler side um, yeah the this this problem of field reconfigurability may introduce another interesting set of compiler problems for example when you um, how do you know that this new p4 program is actually um, something that you can move from the existing p4 com configuration seamlessly mm -hmm. you know that it's not yeah, creating this target this this compiled target you're sort of like yeah. Sliding out the old one and putting in a new one, and you've got control yes. coming down. Yes. How do you know you haven't broken the control? Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes you may be able to achieve this seamless migration. Sometimes you might not. How would you know? It's target specific and program specific. Mm -hmm. And then if you know that, yeah, it's, it's doable. And how? What's the the migration process? Also has to be generated by the compiler, right? Mm -hmm. So that's. That's an interesting problem, in my opinion, because the existing uh, CPU-based programming world, there is no such thing as field reprogrammability, right? Right. When you have a new program, you kill the existing program, and you just simply run the new program. Right, right. So I'm not sure how much of the existing theories and uh, learnings you can borrow from there. And hence, it's an interesting problem to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's definitely one that the this, this sort of software community has looked at a bit in terms of like, uh, you know, seamless software upgrades and, and things yep. like that for security patches and other things like that. Yep. A whole yep. other, well, that's, that seems very interesting. Oh, cool. Well, thanks for, thanks for your time. Uh, really appreciate it. I, I think the students will, will enjoy watching as well. And um, uh, I guess in about a year or so, we'll do this again. And, um, and I guess we'll see yep. what happens with P4 in the next year. I think it should be... Uh, yep. Really exciting, so thanks. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. It's been fun. Thank you.